morning, everyone, and welcome to this special evening here in The Hague, commemorating the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Welcome, President Youssef, Minister Bloch, and Mayor Van Zane. And, of course, our students here, but not to forget, also you, our digital viewers watching from all over the world. Bonsoir à tous et bienvenue à cette soirée spéciale à l'AI, commémorant le 75e anniversaire des Nations Unies. Bienvenue au président Youssouf, au le ministre Stef Blok, au maire de l'AI, Jan van Zane, aux étudiants ici à la Palais de la Paix, et bien sûr à vous, internautes qui, qui regardent de partout dans le monde. My name is Hajar Yakoubi, and I'm one of the UN Youth, I'm a former UN Youth representative of the Netherlands. And tonight, we are here because we are all experts in our own right, all driven by the same urgency and the same courage to make this world a better place. And tonight, we will talk with young people to hear how they want to shape their future and what they think that the future of the United Nations will have to look, look like. Tonight, we are going to set justice and peace in motion. So here, in the next hour and a half, in the stunning Great Hall of Justice of the Peace Palace, we are going to listen to an inspiring dialogue between these young people here in this room. We're going to listen to them and see what we can learn about the future that we need. But before we do that, I want to ask you a quick question. Can you all switch on your mobile phones and share your thoughts with us on Twitter through the hashtag Hague Talks and share our thoughts with, with, of you with us on Facebook and on Instagram. Let's connect with people who commit to making real change happen together. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to ask your attention for a message from His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Gutierrez, Secretary General of the United Nations. Dear friends, it is a pleasure to greet the people and government of the Netherlands on United Nations Day. Thank you all for coming together to mark the organization's 75th anniversary. The United Nations draws great strength from our home in The Hague, where the International Court of Justice and other bodies work to uphold international law and advance the peaceful settlement of disputes. We are especially grateful to the students from all over the world taking part in this ceremony online or in person at the Peace Palace. I look forward to reading The Hague Youth Manifesto the product of many important dialogues on the future we want. Thank you for your voices and your vision. The United Nations is committed to listening and acting. Today's milestone falls in the middle of a global pandemic. Our founding mission is more critical than ever, to promote human dignity, protect human rights, respect international law, and save humanity from war. When the pandemic hit, I called for a global ceasefire. In our world today, we have one common enemy, COVID-19. Now is the time for a stepped-up push for peace to achieve a global ceasefire. The clock is ticking. We must also make peace with our planet. The climate emergency threatens life itself. We must mobilize the whole world to reach carbon neutrality, net zero emissions of greenhouse gases, by 2050. A growing number of countries, cities and companies have already pledged to meet this goal. Around the world, we must do more to end human suffering from poverty, inequality, hunger and hatred, and fight discrimination on the basis of race, religion, gender, or any other distinction. The months of pandemic have seen a horrific rise in violence against women and girls. We must build on progress. A remarkable global collaboration is underway for a safe, affordable, and accessible COVID-19 vaccine for all. The Sustainable Development Goals give us an inspiring blueprint for recovering better. We face colossal challenges. With global solidarity and cooperation, we can overcome them. That's what the United Nations is all about. On this anniversary, I ask people everywhere to join together. The United Nations not only stands with you, the United Nations belongs to you and is you, we the peoples. Together, let us uphold the enduring values of the United Nations Charter. Let us build on our advances across the decades. Let us realize our shared vision of a better world for all. Across the decades, the United Nations has benefited greatly from the contribution of the Netherlands. We will count on your continued engagement and support as we continue this vital work. Thank you. Yes.
The United Nations is you, and the United Nations belongs to you. Shortly, we are going to engage in a discussion with these young people present here and the students online as well to talk about this. But first, I would like to hear reflections from two distinguished guests that we have with us here today. I would like to invite Judge Abdelkawi Ahmed Youssef, President of the International Court of Justice, to share his thoughts with us. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency Minister Block, Honorable Mayor of The Hague, Excellencies, distinguished representatives of the youth who are here with us, and of course, all the young people who are joining us by video link. Welcome to the Peace Palace. It is a great honor for me to welcome you all to the Peace Palace and to the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. The Peace Palace and the United Nations are a perfect fit. They are both dedicated from their very inception to peace and harmony among nations. Today, the Peace Palace is the seat of the International Court of Justice, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. The court was established to save future generations from the scourge of wars that twice brought untold tragedy to the entire world in the 20th century. For the sake of the youth representatives who are with us here today, it might be useful to recall some of the commitments of the peoples of the United Nations whom you represent here today, but who were represented in San Francisco by an older generation. They committed in the Charter, on behalf of all the peoples of the world, one, to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors. Two, to unite their strength to maintain international peace and security. Three, to ensure by the acceptance of the principles and the institutional methods of the United Nations that armed force shall not be used save in the common interest. And finally, to employ international machinery for the promotion of the economic and social advancement of all peoples. These are all pledges taken by the representatives of the peoples in the preamble of the Charter of the United Nations. Despite these pledges, we still see conflicts, violence, and large-scale human suffering in many parts of the world. We have to admit that this is not actually due mainly to the malfunctioning or the failure of the United Nations and its organs, or of the rules and principles established in the UN Charter. It is rather due to the lack of political will to use the institutions of the UN and to apply the rules of the Charter of the United Nations. Of course, the United Nations is like all human institutions. It's not a perfect one. It, it has its deficiencies, it has its shortcomings. But it cannot do more than its member states want it to accomplish. It is made up of member states. So speaking the language of peace may be easy, but living together in peace often requires courage. And I will give you an example because I'm from Somalia. And in my culture, you greet those you meet every day with the word nabat, which means peace. You greet everyone in peace when you meet them. Yet, peace has eluded my nation for the past 30 years. Both the United Nations and the African Union have tried and are still trying to help with peacekeeping and peacemaking missions on the ground. However, it is ultimately for the Somali people themselves to resolve their conflict 
and to learn to live together in peace, what they say to each other every day, Nabat. This is not the first time the United Nations has come to the succor of the Somali people. It was with the assistance of the United Nations that actually Somalia acceded to independence in 1960. It was also by virtue of the UN Charter and the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples that all African nations were able to throw off the yoke of colonialism and take their rightful place in the community of nations. I would not probably be standing here today in front of you as president of the International Court of Justice if it was not for the process of decolonization which was carried out and spearheaded by the United Nations. I therefore have a personal reason to celebrate the past 75 years of the United Nations. But I also have an institutional reason to celebrate, because the International Court of Justice is the home of peacemaking among nations through the law. In the past 75 years, the court has proudly assumed its role as a guardian of the international rule of law. Its action is, however, based on the consent of states. They have to uh, be willing to accept, or they must have accepted in advance, the jurisdiction of the court to resolve their disputes peacefully. In other words, they must have faith in the rule of law and in the capacity of, of an independent judicial body to interpret it and apply it. The good news is that this faith, has, this faith has substantially increased in the past 25 years. More trust is placed today in the work of the court than ever before. But to avoid the risk of regression and a return to world wars, barbarism, and widespread atrocities of the past, because you know that's what we had in the past, before the United Nations. My message today to the youth is to carry forward the beacon of peace and justice set alight by the UN Charter. You have the power to influence and guide your peoples for the common good. You can foster tolerance and understanding among nations and within nations. You can educate your peers not to hate those who are different from them and to live in peace and harmony with others. In the words of the famous American poet, Denise Levertov, you can give them the imagination of peace to ouster the intense, familiar imagination of disaster. However, you will have to keep in mind at the same time, and I quote from the poem of uh, Denis Levertov, Making Peace, that peace, like a poem, is not there ahead of itself, cannot be imagined before it's made, cannot be known except in the words of its making. Grammar of justice, syntax of mutual aid. This is what we do here in this great hall of justice where you are sitting today. Through our judgments, every day, we compose the words of peacemaking, the grammar of justice and the syntax of mutual understanding through the law. Welcome again to the home of peacemaking. I thank you. Yes. Thank you, President Yusuf, for those beautiful words and such an inspiring message. The floor will also be open later on for dialogue with the young people. But is there anybody who already wants to ask a question right now?
Yes, go ahead and you can introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Ella McLeod and I'm a student at The Hague University. And my question is, the UN Secretary General has sought to mainstream gender parity within the UN system. What is the role of international law in advancing this agenda? And what role has the court played in advancing human rights, including gender parity? Well, the international law we apply here is based on the Charter of the United Nations. And the preamble of the Charter already refers to equality between men, men and women, to equality between nations, small or big or large. And therefore, that equality is inscribed in the Charter of the United Nations, and therefore we have to apply it, and we apply it at the International Court of Justice, whether it is with respect to gender equality or equality among nations. For us, all are equal before the law. Everybody is equal before the law. Now, with respect to gender parity, in the registry of the International Court of Justice, we are actually at the head of the list, except for the entity which deals in the United Nations with gender equality and empowerment of women, which is known as the UN Women. The UN Women has the highest number, the highest percentage of staff, uh, a, uh, of female staff in the UN system. The court comes second. We have 56% of our staff are female staff members, and therefore we are beyond parity. And if you come to the corridors of the court, you will realize that. And as far as the court itself is concerned, we are 15 judges that are elected by the General Assembly and the Security Council of the United Nations. We do not elect ourselves. So there, unfortunately, parity is not yet realized. We have to talk to the member states okay. and tell them that the International Court of Justice and all other courts require gender parity. We have three members now, female judges of the court, we need more. Yes. And therefore, we hope that the member states will listen to you, nominate candidates, women candidates, and elect them at the yes, General Assembly the and future. Security Council. Thank you so much, President Yusuf, for your contribution. Thank you, Ella, for the question. Uh, we now go on to the second segment for today, and that is a special musical contribution by harpist and Goodwill Ambassador Lavinia Meyer and by Good Freedom Ambassador Laila Pornavorac. They will perform their variation of Hymn des Nations by, Char by Charles Grelinger, and they will perform a beautiful piece by Philip Glass. United Music 75 is a musical Instagram journey to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the UN and its International Court of Justice in The Hague. This challenge is a call for action to show solidarity and highlights the convening power of music for a common cause, peace through justice. Musicians from all over the world create their own variations of the Hymne de Nation and share these on Instagram under hashtag UnitedMusic75. The Hymne de Nation was written in 1913 by Jewish Dutch composer Charles Greininger for the opening of the Peace Palace in The Hague, where the United Nations International Court of Justice is seated. During transport to Auschwitz, the composer died, but his music lives on. The theme of peace, hope and solidarity is the common thread running through Gehlinger's song. United Music 75 aims to foster solidarity and connect people, countries and cultures by creating a long and diverse musical chain. To date, musicians from over 30 countries have shared their version of Grelinger's song. The goal is to have at least 75 countries represented by April 2021 
at the 75th anniversary of the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Join in, share your variation and be part of this musical chain. Ovoj ogromnoj zemlji verbindt ons de eerbied voor andermans waarden. Through this, barriers are removed, hope, affection and mutual solidarity are created. On this vast earth, poštovanje prema vrijednostima drugi ljudi povezuje nas. Zo gaan barrières te niet. Ontstaat hoop, genegenheid en onderlinge solidariteit. Op deze uitgestrekte aarde. Respect for other people's values connects us. Krosto, barrières se uklone. A opstrana solidarność se creira. Thank you, Laila. That was truly beautiful. And to everybody watching at home, join the musical chain and spread the word because there will be 75 variations by April next year. And now I want to go on to our next speaker of the evening, none other than Minister Stef Bloch himself, the Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs. Minister Bloch, the floor is all yours. 
Thank you. Judge Yusuf, Mayor Van Zane, and uh, of course everybody else listening here today or online. It is a pleasure to be speaking to you on this very special occasion. Just as powerful and grand as the idea of world peace itself, tout aussi puissant et grandiose que l'idée même de paix mondiale, this is how a Dutch writer once described the Peace Palace. This, and there is no better place to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Not only because this is a palace of peace, but also because it feels like a temple of justice, with signs in Latin that uh, exude moral authority. Sedant arma togae, let uh, the arms yield to toga. Authority that you eagerly accept as a visitor, and it's authority that uh, UN needs if it wants to be successful in the next 75 years. For me, rules, law, moral authority are key ingredients in today's commemoration. And not only for me, but also for many young people. Because according to the UN survey carried out for today's dialogue, a lot of you support what the UN is doing. And we, the international community, must take responsibility when it comes to climate change, to grinding poverty, to abuse of power. And because we aren't taking responsibility, we lack moral authority. For many, the UN is not a beautiful palace, but an abstract and sometimes stuffy organization, an organization you have little influence over. And that's why I applaud the UN's global dialogue and also the tremendous participation of young people like you here today. And I'd like to share a small piece of history that concerns personal influence, a piece of history that shows how you can leave your mark on the international community and international law not only for your own generation, but also for the subsequent ones. Well, you mean uh, Hugo Grotius, you may think now, with his famous plea for freedom of the seas and free trade, the Mare Liberum. This Dutchman was indeed one of the founders of public international law. But I'm actually talking about someone else, someone who also fought for justice, and especially against torture. And this is what he once said. Torture, deliberately inflicting pain and injury on a defenseless victim, happened routinely, often with electric current, which is handy and clean. The field telephone could be used for that. And perhaps these words sound familiar. They may remind you of news that you've heard recently of opponents of the Assad regime being tortured to death, of the internment camps that China continues to build for Uyghurs, of the masked gangs who beat defenseless protesters in Belarus, or maybe the words remind you of recent reports of brutality done by the police, for instance, the injustice done to George Floyd. These examples probably spark in you a sense of injustice and a sense of courage. Of course, the reference to a field telephone makes it clear that we are dealing with a different era. I was quoting the Dutchman Hermann Burgers. In 1947, he was sent to Indonesia, where he went to work for the court martial, and he heard about unacceptable practices. And one of these concerned the torturing of prisoners to obtain intelligence. And this left an indelible impression on him. In his own words, I have a deep abhorrence of torture, 
which will always remain with me. Berger's sense of injustice spurned him on to great achievements that have benefited our world. From 1982 to 1984, he headed the United Nations Working Group that drafted the International Convention Against Torture. And Syria ratified the treaty in 2004, when Bashar al-Assad was already president. And in doing so, the Syrian regime made an explicit commitment to prevent and combat torture and other cruel treatment or punishment. These promises have been systematically broken. And it was therefore with reference to this treaty that on the 18th of September, the Netherlands announced to hold Syria responsible for serious violations of its obligations under international law. And I'm telling you this story of Hermann Burgers because it shows us something valuable about the strength of one person and about the potential of one organization, the UN, which is actually the potential we all have. The story also tells us how outrage and injustice can lead to more justice and how the UN can make that possible. In fact, we can all make that possible, in theory at least, because often the international community does not act quickly and firmly enough. I'm also telling you this because it shows us the direction we need to be heading. Not just when it comes to stopping torture, not just when it comes to human rights and democracy, and not just when it comes to international justice, but also when it comes to how countries need to work together in the broad sense. How we should jointly strive for a more just, prosperous and peaceful world. And how we should strengthen the systems we built together after the Second World War to protect our rights, our prosperity, our security. That includes, of course, the UN, but also NATO, European Union. Ambitious projects born out of a conviction that we need to solve problems together and to protect the values we stand for. Organizations that have reached a certain age but without gaining the respect that comes with it. You will hear the most complex analysis on why international cooperation is in dire straits. But the bottom line is that the world will only move forward if we honor our agreements. International cooperation starts with international commitment. And it's precisely for this reason that the Netherlands is holding Syria to account. The Netherlands is taking this step above all for the sake of the Syrian population. But we're also doing it for the international community because we want to combat impunity all over the world. And because if crimes go unpunished, the injustice is doubled. If we turn a blind eye to what we say we cannot tolerate, we undermine the power and credibility of the international organizations that strive to uphold the agreements we've made. And, as I say, this is a double setback for the world. We are making rules and agreements that we do not uphold. Just look around you. Trade is less fair, a direct result of a weakened World Trade Organization. The world is less safe, a direct consequence of the cancellation of agreements on disarmament. And that threatens the biggest achievement of an organization like the UN. The prevention of a version of history we don't want to see. This is where you will find its true success. The absence of a third world war. The Cold War that has always remained cold. But consider all the landmines that have not exploded. Thanks to the treaty against landmines. And there have been more successes. Together, we closed the hole in the ozone layer. And polio 
has been virtually eradicated. Smallpox has completely disappeared. All of this is at risk if we continue to be nonchalant about the rules. Taking a you could, but you don't have to approach. So this is my message today. Let us work to ensure our international cooperation has teeth. That means a deal is a deal. If you sign a treaty, you stick to it. It means taking responsibility. For example, when it comes to respecting EU rules. On the rule of law, on healthy budget, on competitive economies, or when it comes to the World Trade Organization, if you join it, you must open up your markets. It also means taking a critical look at yourself. For example, the Netherlands needs to step up its efforts to reach NATO's 2% threshold on defense spending. Finally, it also means strengthening and renewing structures, developing a new system of arms control, for example, and ensuring we have a workable WTO, dispute settlement, a system to tackle unfair trade practices, and a World Health Organization that functions transparently and effectively. Faltering structures and international community that is slow to act must not get in the way of the people. We can make a true difference. Today's generation of people, like Hugo de Groot and Herman Burgers, people like all of you, young people, must be able to participate in the UN. I really feel strongly about that. Not only because today's problems are your problems, but also because you can solve those problems. My appeal to you today is please don't get discouraged. Join the conversation, not just today, also tomorrow. Make your voice heard. Take a fresh look at world problems and at an organization that, while it may appear stuffy, has a value surpassing that of palaces. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Minister Block. And I think there are some students who perhaps want to ask a question right away. Very powerful words. Is there anybody who wants to ask a question? Mm. I see that we have Isi, yes, over here. Um, a digital question from Isi. Yeah. Good evening. Thank you for your words on the role of youth in peacekeeping and peace building, and for inviting me to ask you a question tonight. My name is Issy Madajemu and I am from Leiden University. And my question for you, Minister Block, is this. The Netherlands has a proud history of peacekeeping. But what role is the country playing in trying to bring peace to the forever wars in Afghanistan, Libya and Yemen? Thank you very much. I, I fully understand why you speak about, as you call it, forever wars in, in Afghanistan, in, in Libya, Syria. Of course, our aim is that it won't be forever worse. But at the same time, as long as these wars go on, even if it would be indeed forever, there is a role for us to take. And the Netherlands has a tradition, a feeling of commitment to contribute to world peace, how difficult it may be in the, in the countries you mentioned, and thereby use actually the whole range. Uh, if, if it must be a military presence, nobody likes it, but security is, is the first thing ordinary people will ask for in, in all of those countries. Uh, the, the possibility to, to go to school, to do your work, to be safe, especially for women and children. But even if we have a military presence, we always want to accompany it with development assistance, with empowering youth and women, with making sure that, that youth can go to school, and with, with working on, on the fundamentals, the, uh, the maybe nitty-gritty work of, of building a functioning a judiciary, uh, making sure that democracy can work, that, that people are fairly 
represented. So it's like the greater good of development that you're doing it for then? Yes. It is greater good, and, and the good news is that in, in uh, two of the countries you mentioned, uh, Libya and Afghanistan, recently peace talks started. Okay. Success yes. is not guaranteed, but there is a shimmer of light. Yes. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, we now go on to another segment of the program, and that is of none other than Ms. Jayatma Vikramanayake. She is the UN Youth Envoy of the United Nations, and with regard to the resolution of youth peace and security, or for the very first time in the history of the United Nations, young people, the emphasis was placed on their role as change makers for peace. She will tell us more about that through all the work that she has done. So let's start the video. Excellencies, young ladies, dear friends, it's a pleasure to virtually join all of you to celebrate the UN Day this year. As the UN marks its 75th anniversary in a year characterized by unprecedented crises, it is as important as ever to support and amplify youth voices in shaping the future we want. I am pleased to see so many young people coming together for forward-looking, youth-driven global dialogues in the spirit of the UN 75, and I warmly welcome the announcement of the Hague Youth Manifesto as a part of today's event. And what better place to be having these conversations than at the Hague Peace Palace? For young people to actively shape their futures, they need peace, justice and inclusion. However, they are often most affected by conflict, injustice and exclusion. The UN Security Council's landmark resolution 2250 recognizes the important role and the positive role young people play in promotion and maintenance of international peace and security. It also provides the mandate to systematically work on issues of youth peace and security directly in partnership with young people. As we mark the fifth anniversary of the resolution this year, we have an opportunity to take stock of the progress made in this area and to celebrate a youth inclusive agenda that was created by young people for young people. To accomplish our collective goal of sustainable peace, we need all global decision makers to support a positive discourse on youth inclusion, empowerment and participation while also investing resources in youth-led peace building initiatives. If we are to have any hope of delivering on the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, we need to start by listening to young people, by adapting our structures and creating enabling environments that allow youth to fulfill their capacities, ideas and vision for a better world. Thank you for your leadership and support. After those powerful words from the United Nations Youth Envoy, uh, I'm happy to present our students this evening. My name is Professor Alana O'Malley. I'm Professor of United Nations Studies in Peace and Justice at Leiden University and the Hague University of Applied Sciences. This is a special position created by the City of The Hague to honour the work of former Mayor and Foreign Minister Josias van Artsen. The students so, who we are about to hear from, came together with many others from schools and universities across the Netherlands in September to discuss how to change the UN. Their visions and their ideas presented here aim to create the future we want and the UN we need. So, Rita, I turn to you for the first statement. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rita and I am a student from the United Nations University, married in Maastricht. It is an honor to be here this evening representing the youth and in particular women. Women, girls, the backbone of a nation. Health, education, political and labor force participation, economic well-being, freedom from violence, all are among the most basic human rights. Sadly, many women lack these basic rights. The gender gap remains a critical problem from the levels of global governance to local communities. How can we close this gap? What are some of the effective ways and how can the youth play a part? Let's take an exemplary fast developing nation, my country, Rwanda. 
The country has shown tremendous progress in gender equality and women emancipation since the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. You can feel it when you walk through the streets and measure it economically. It all began with government commitment, the leadership of the nation to end gender-based discrimination. First and foremost, we believe political leadership is fundamental in closing this gap. It starts with the UN on the international level. Women representation in leadership is low. It is at a rate of 34.8% in the UN Secretariat. There has, for instance, never been a female Secretary General since its initiation in 1945. We, the youth, call for reforms in the UN system in this regard. Secondly, women representation in all forms of society is a crucial element in ending the gender gap. Once again, taking an example from Rwanda, women empowerment in parliament is 64%. In cabinet, 52%. Now, women empower other women to help achieve equality. The representation of women, the commitment of a nation to defy patriarchy and to stand for human rights and equality, and the promotion of female leadership not only leads to a step towards closing the gender gap, but also fulfills the SDGs. Thirdly, to the local level. We should strive for equal participation of women and girls in the private sector. This equal participation springs from better education that creates a highly skilled workforce. This equal participation um, creates a highly skilled workforce. Therefore, we believe young women should be provided with an opportunity to gain higher education without discrimination. There should be enforcement and creation of skill training centers for women in every sector of the economy. In Rwanda, for example, there is high participation of women in the labor sector. 42% of enterprises are led for, by women, and this accounts for 30% of the GDP. This has boosted Rwanda's business sector, empowered women, and led to positive spillovers, such as reduced poverty levels, reduced mortality rates, and increased health care. Rwanda, Nicaragua, Sweden, amongst others, have progressed tremendously in closing the gender gap. However, more still needs to be done. More still needs to be done globally to close the gender gap. Governments need to be committed. We, the youth, call upon governments to enhance policies aimed at eliminating gender disparities. To conclude, Educate a woman and she'll uplift her community. Empower a woman, she'll empower a nation. The cycle continues, it's only sustainable. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tijma Zuiderwijk, a student from the Dalton de Hague, currently participating in the Van Aertsen Honors Project. In our discussions, we all agreed that the climate crisis is one of the great challenges of our lifetimes. Even though it may not be prominently on everyone's mind at this very moment, it is not any less urgent. Our governments need to take more action. They all signed the Paris Agreement back in 2015 because it sounded good, it sounded green, and it sounded like votes. But now that the time has come to actually realize those plans, not all of them are as enthusiastic anymore. It is more than reasonable to expect, like Minister Bloch said, that leaders hold each other accountable to the promises they make to the world, be it on climate or on torture, and actively fight to uphold them. Additionally, it is more than important that we young people keep pushing our politicians and leaders to work with and not for us when it comes to reversing climate change. Not always have our politicians listened to us. And honestly, can we blame them? Yes, we talk about our big plans, our great ideas, and our wonderful future, and then blame them for not doing enough to make them happen. But are we doing enough to make them happen? I'm honestly not so sure. We, the people, could be doing more to work with each other on an international scale to share our ideas, resources, and knowledge. However, this has to start at a grassroots level in our homes, schools, and neighborhoods. Let us prove by our actions, our campaigns, and our changes 
that we can do more than just add to the noise and that we have deserved our seat at the UN climate table. For example, we should not assume that every single person actually knows how quickly climate change is affecting the Earth every single day. Some might simply not have had access to the useful information, while others might have been wrongly influenced by false facts and figures. We must go back into the streets, our schools and our sports clubs, once we can safely do this, of course, to make sure that everyone understands the importance of the information when it comes to climate change. We must get the word out that the truth is still inconvenient. Let us never forget the following. Even though we should trust our governments and actively work with them, the responsibility is ultimately our own. This includes you, watching at home or in this room. I need you to take your responsibility and do your part however small that may be, to guarantee we overcome this. I am counting on you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we turn to Julia for the first question. Hello, my name is Julia Gulhovska and I am a public policy student at Maastricht University. Um, my question is for all panelists and is as follows. The youth are powerful actors of uh, change in tackling the climate crisis. How has the Dutch government responded to the school strikes for climate action, which took place in 2019? Thank you. Mr. Block, perhaps you would like to answer that? Yes, well, it neatly follows to your plea for um, uh, more climate action. Um, we agreed with um, a, a number of um, uh, societal organizations, including some youth, maybe not enough, but, but also environmental organizations, uh, labor unions, business life, on a path forward to reach the pericles. Uh, we managed to agree, uh, but, but I fully understand, uh, understood why uh, you are worried, because the implementation is hard work. That is a combination of, of, of the technical difficulties, of course. Well, we need uh, progress in, in, in science, uh, technology to, to make it possible. We need political will and ambition. Um, and we have to engage the public, that, that usually of course, share the concerns, but they have other concerns too. And they have their worries, and they ask, will it be feasible for me? Will I be able to pay? That, that's why it's important that, that you say, we want to take action, and we want you, you, that means me, to take action, because we need people that, that motivate us and other people to take often difficult steps into partly uncharted territory. It won't be easy, but we need to continue to encur uh, encourage each other because uh, you, you rightly re refer to what I said. We signed an international um, uh, agreement to take those steps, and now we have to take those steps. So we will continue the momentum. Thank you, Minister. Now we're going to talk to Amr, who's coming to us from Egypt. Hello, everyone. I'm Amr from Egypt. I work as project coordinator for Masarata project of RNW Media, and I will take you through challenges that face Egyptian youth in accessing the labor market and propose some solutions and recommendations. As you know, during recessions, young people face greater barriers, barriers than adults in securing decent employment. Young women especially are more likely to become or remain unemployed. This, is way, this situation is further compounded by the COVID-19 crisis, which will impact GDP growth uh, rates if, uh, and if sustained, and could increase the current poverty rate here of 27, and further plunge young people into unemployment. Youth unemployment in Egypt is estimated at 31 percentage. Uh, for, for out of out of these 31 percentage, like. 40% among women and 26% among men. 
uh, high population growth and low labor absorption rates require innov innovative solutions to support young Egyptians, especially women, in accessing economic opportunities. The majority of employed youth find work through informal networks of family and the friends, and the friends which means disadvantaged youth are marginalized by the lack of such networks. Research conducted by RNW Media in 2020 identified that young people face many challenges regarding employment, such as lack of computer literacy, access to reliable information, technical skills, foreign language proficiency, and lack of previous experience and relevant networks. So, reliable labor market information, job search assistance, technical and soft skills training are critical and crucial to address supply side barriers to youth employment, to youth unemployment. And I would call for helping, helping to build young people's technical and work readiness skills so they can take advantage of employment, connecting young people with the skills with job, uh, with job opportunities in the labor market, increased access to digital skills that improve youth employability and work readiness, especially with COVID-19 situation, and advocacy and the campaigning focusing on decent work for women and lobbying for employment of young women in the private sector. Thank you all. Thank you, Amr. Now I turn to Nezreen for the next question. Good evening, all. Uh, my name is Nezreen Ahmed from uh, Erosin Mondrian, a major in marketing and communications. My question for today was, how does the United Nations intend to stimulate the next generation over the next 25 years to take initiative to come up with new creative and innovative solutions to tackle global challenges? Perhaps, Mr. President, I can ask you to answer that one. Well, I think that uh, my answer to that question is very simple. Uh, the youth must be given a seat at the table. Uh, they will not be able to come up with creative solutions. They will not be able to suggest innovative solutions unless they have a seat at the table. And therefore, the UN will have to involve the youth uh, more often in its work and to include them in the panelists, in the committees, in the meetings that take place in the UN. There have to be youth representatives everywhere. There are now youth representatives to the UN, but there are not many. We need more. So that's my answer. Thank you. Now I turn to Diana for the next presentation. Thank you. Excellencies, members of government, industry representatives present, deans and my fellow students, good evening. My name is Dana Owur. I am a budding policy analyst from Nairobi, Kenya, presently studying at UNU Merit. Thank you for granting me the honor and the privilege to address you through this blended platform on the pertinent topic of inequality. On behalf of the community of practitioners, students, policymakers, and UN representatives who gathered on September 25th, and rigorously sought solutions to this crisis, I come before you to present our findings. We are deeply saddened by the health and economic deterioration caused by COVID-19 that risks eroding gains made in the last three decades to offset inequality. Now more than ever, we need to reaffirm our common commitment to the fight against inequality. Inequality manifests itself in terms of access, in terms of outcomes, in terms of risk exposure. While it exists across all nations, some are most significantly affected. Across the world, young and old people alike have risen up to protest against extreme inequality. What are world leaders doing to combat this crisis? How can we make a difference at this time on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations? Noting the proportion of young people like us poised to bear the short and long-term consequences of the current situation, we propose the following mitigation measures. First, the creation of the Office of a Special Envoy for Youth Inequality with regional, national, and sub-national representatives to serve as gateways for young people in co-creation of solutions to the problems that directly affect us. Recalling Her Excellency, the Prime, the, 
first lady of Namibia who said that if you are included at the table but you cannot ch change the agenda, you've not been included, you've just been co-opted. This office will be mandated to examine the challenges of inequality on the youth and report its findings and policy recommendations to the UN Sustainable Development Group. Through a consultative process with stakeholders, the envoys must develop partnerships with youth organizations, NGOs, various levels of government, and all UN agencies working in their respective countries to create and test policies for implementation. This would culminate in an annual summit on youth inequality. Second, strengthen the multi approach to inequality. The UN should collaborate with local government in developing and implementing unique solutions to the regional realities inside countries. For instance, by partnering with regional youth entrepreneurship hubs. This would create a framework for dialogue between the UN country teams and different regional and city leaders, further developing best practice against inequality and fostering the advancement towards the SDGs. Third, promote and develop avenues for higher education for youth in all countries, regardless of background. This education must appreciate critical factors such as human dignity and freedom. Recalling the Human Development Report 2000 that stated in part, if income is not the sum total of human lives, lack of income cannot be the sum total of human deprivation. It follows therefore that any effort to combat inequality must appreciate all contributing factors of which education is a part. This is especially critical for nations like mine that seek to escape the middle income trap and for nations desiring to pull out of low income status. Measures here would include stronger scholarship support schemes, more promotion of opportunities and facilitating the mobility of younger scholars through education exchanges and cultural interchanges. This should be developed at a national and international level to provide and access to more educational opportunities for as many youth as possible. As technology continues to expand the possibilities of human experience, I welcome you to join us as we continue to advocate for reduced inequalities. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Gani, would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, hello, I am Gani Den Hertog. Uh, I study at the Edith Stein College and I was a previous participant of the Van Aert and Arnos program. Uh, my question is, as inequality rises, um, we lack the luxury of time to formulate a response. What has the Dutch government currently done to combat the problem of inequality within the youth? Thank you. Speaking of the luxury of time, it's not a luxury that we have, so I'm going to move immediately to the next presentation and take the answers together at the end, okay? So, Alexander, would you like to give us your statement, please? Thank you. Your Excellencies, Your Honour, Distinguished Guests. My name is Alexander Lerving. I live in Maastricht where I study public policy and human development at the Graduate School of Governance affiliated with the United Nations University. Next to my study, studies, I've also founded a political party and have been elected to the City Council of Maastricht. It is a great honour and privilege to stand here today to report on our talks and present our recommendations. More than anything, I see this day in this year as a stark reminder of how the world and the nature of conflict has changed in the last 75 years. Yet, the United Nations has changed so little. This speaks to the relevance of its purpose, but also to the immob immobility of its institution. Now more than ever, we envision a decisive role for the United Nations in providing the world with a new leadership. First and foremost, we ask you to recognize the growing discontent regarding the political status quo. Around the world, we see civil frustration brought forth by unsustainable economics and political dissonance. We also see a failing of global governance and a subsequent failure to address global crises. Considering that today, one in six of the world population is aged between 15 and 24 only adds up to its urgency. Second, we recognize that never before have threats to international peace and security been as oblivious to the concept of borders as they are today. What better illustration than the current pandemic? The UN stands out like no other institution ready to provide global leadership. 
we recognize that this will require fundamental reform to its institution, which can only be achieved by incremental steps. My generation is ready to take these steps, but you must pass the baton. In other words, the UN needs to adapt a more holistic approach and mandate the re its resident coordinators to partner up with youth organizations and appoint change makers to promote civic engagement. Recognizing young leaders as key stakeholders will allow the United Nations to embed herself within local communities and make tangible what a global community can signify on a local level. Third, we believe that special political missions need more flexibility. Now more than ever, the UN needs to play an active role in bridging gaps and engaging with civil society organizations. The UN needs to seek more interdependence between agencies to better connect between missions, especially when state-centric strategies are limited and local mandates are incomplete. All in all, we believe in human ingenuity to overcome its challenges. Never in our history has humankind been faced with such prospects of development and prosperity. If only we can meet these challenges in these next few decades, which are right now in the making, can we guarantee a peaceful legacy alongside a mature and well-guided society? All we ask you is to enable us, for the stakes are too high to simply not. Thank you. Thank you. I turn to our uh, final two questions from our online speakers. The first is from Roxanne. Thank you, Alana. Good evening, everyone. And thank you all for this fascinating discussion today. My name is Roxanne van der Bleek, and I'm a master's student in conflict resolution and governance at the University of Amsterdam. My question is for President Yusuf. Should the ICJ open the doors of the Peace Palace and allow the, the general public entry in order to highlight the role of the court in shaping global governance and increase its public image. Thank you. Mr. President. Our doors are always open and they will always remain open to the public, except of course, during this COVID period in which, as you know, it is difficult to interact uh, with many people. Uh, in 20, I think in 2018, 20, 2017, 2018, if I remember the figure as well, uh, we received more than 3,000 people here in the Peace Palace, mostly students and young people. And I always speak to them here in this great hall of justice and brief them on the work of the court. And in 2019, 2020, before the COVID-19 hit us in March, there must have been around 2,500 visitors uh, to the Peace Palace. So we welcome visitors. It is in our own interest that the public, the young people, and uh, all of those who are not acquainted with our work should actually be informed about our work. And we do our best to remain open, and I can assure you, we will always have our doors open to the public. Thank you, Mr. President. For the final question of the evening, I'm turning to Pep Hein. Good evening. Thank you all for your contributions, and thanks for having me, even though it is just digitally. My name is Pep Hein van Aken. I'm from the Netherlands, and I'm enrolled in the MA International Relations Program at Leiden University. My question is for all panelists. Do you have any advice for young people who want to pursue a career at the United Nations or in international relations? Thank you. Thank you. Minister, can I prompt you for an answer to this and also for Ghani's earlier question about youth inequality? Well, I'll, I'll start with Ghani because uh, you were the, the first one. And actually, you, your question followed neatly up to the questions raised by the participants from, from Kenya and um, Egypt, because he also spoke about the often dire situation of youth in their countries. With regard to the Netherlands, uh, where we are blessed with one of the, the highest level of, of um, uh, welfare in, in the world, but that doesn't mean we don't have disaffected youth. So even in a country like ours, 
it is a task for me and my colleagues to make sure that, that young people in disadvantaged position have extra attention in, in education, um, uh, maybe family help. And for youth outside uh, the Netherlands, uh, whenever I speak to, to my colleagues from uh, uh, countries um, uh, that, that are, let's say, um, uh, medium developed, I can always offer them the possibility of investments by Dutch companies, but I always add that they will only come if they know that it is a country where rule of law is respected. And that uh, whenever a Dutch company <coughs> asks me or any of my colleagues for uh, government support, we will always tell them, you have to respect the sustainable development goals in order to receive our help for your investment. So in, in that small way, but, but in line with the importance we attach to the, to the UN, and we incite Dutch companies to make a contribution, whether it be in Egypt or in uh, Kenya or in the Netherlands. Um, and, and then with regard to the carrier advice, um, be curious, don't be afraid, dare to ask people to give you open advice. That means also to be critical about things that you have to improve. And be broad, because for the United Nations or the Dutch government, society as a whole, you are just as useful, whether you are a dip diplomat working for the UN or for me, a teacher, an engineer, a youth worker, and maybe even starting in a certain profession, profession and then turning to international work may also have a great added value. Eh? Starting as an engineer and then um, uh, improving uh, irrigation works somewhere in the world where it's even harder needed than in the Netherlands. So we are all members of the UN and we can, the UN takes all professions on board. Thank you very much for that excellent advice, Minister Block. If you want to find out more, you can check out the Hague Talks website. Thank you. I hand you back to Hajar. Thank you very much, Alana, and thank you very much to the students present here for this wonderful dialogue. Uh, now, going on to the next segment for today, I want to tell you a little bit more about a special guest that we have here with us. Mert Kumru, he is one of the UN Youth Representatives of the United Nations on the topics of human rights and security. And in the past year, Mert has traveled all around the Netherlands to speak to many thousands of young people and to gather input from them to bring it to the United Nations. Together with young people from all over the world, he has used that input to create the Hague Youth Manifesto. And so without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mert Kumru to tell us a little bit more about the Hague Youth Manifesto. The floor is yours, Mert. <laughs> thank you all, and thank you, Hajar, especially. Welcome, members of the youth. Welcome, our excellencies, and welcome, dear guests. Young people and the presence of young people on the international stage is slowly gaining momentum. In the past couple of years, we have seen numerous of youth-led initiatives, protests and petitions pop up all around the globe. The notion that young people lack the skills, knowledge and or abilities to solve international problems is a too often heard misconception. In the past couple of months, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown that international diplomacy has been shifted. Where conferences were cancelled and international fora were postponed, the voices of millions of young people became effectively unheard. Although efforts have been made to improve these situations, these were not sustainable enough. The aim of our manifesto is to make sure that whenever young people are mentioned, or whenever topics that directly affect us the youth, we are present. You can no longer speak about the youth without inviting them. We're here present today in a wonderful chamber, and this chair symbolizes a very special thing. I'll come back to that later. What's most important is that we want to establish our presence, both formally, but most importantly, permanently. There should be youth consultation at any given point in any body within the system 
of the UN. We have seen that five years ago, the Security Council has passed a landmark resolution for young people, Resolution 2250 on Youth, Peace and Security. This resolution stated the following, young people were no longer only regarded as victims of international conflicts. No, we were seen as active agents of peace. Seeing that we celebrate the 75th anniversary of these United Nations today, we will not let this jubilee go in vain. Therefore, this manifesto, Mr. President, forms the broader idea that we have collected throughout the last months and years of young people all around the globe, from the global south to the global north. This chair symbolizes, and actually forms a wonderful contrast with the chairs behind me, to show that we do not want the luxurious benefits and or all of the things that come with being a permanent member of the UN. We just want to be taken seriously. We want to become a part of the system that has the best for us. This chair symbolizes as well that we are very flexible. We don't want to become, we don't necessarily want to become a part of these seats. We just want to be present at them. We want to negotiate. We want to bring in the points that we also have. It's a foldable chair, so therefore it's easy to place wherever. And we don't need any leather cushions, that's okay. We just want to be taken seriously. And that's the most important thing. Our Excellencies also need to carry out this message. And underneath your seats, you can all find a T-shirt. This T-shirt asks you all to carry out the message and to wear this message as well. Yeah, you can, they're probably the right size. <laughs> our idea needs to be performed in real life as well. And therefore, we'd like to ask you, Mr. President, to carry out this message when you speak with our leaders at the UN. The future of these United Nations is also our future. And we therefore would like to say the following. In order to have meaningful youth participation, you need to have permanent youth consultation. Thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much, Mert, uh, for this, because uh, uh, what you have just said, uh, I think, is uh, quite correct. Uh, the future of the United Nations is, is your future, because uh, those who created the United Nations have already gone. Those of us who are now running the United Nations will soon be gone, but the people who will have to build the future are you. And therefore, everybody will have to listen to you and to your message. And I can promise you that I will deliver the manifesto to the highest levels of the United Nations and make sure that it is received by all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Applause for that. Thank you so much. The youth is not just the future, but also the present. Beautiful words. A nice way to continue on to the next segment. We want to thank Merit for sharing the Hague Youth Manifesto with us. It is available online on the Hague Talks website if you want to check it out. And also make sure to download the beautiful free image that was on the chair right now. And when you do, make sure to put it at a prominent place to let everybody know that we as young people deserve a seat at the table. We need a seat at the table. And the time to do that is now. Speaking about The Hague, I think it's the perfect time to go on to our next speaker, the mayor of The Hague, Jan van Zane. I'd like to invite him over here to share his insights with us as mayor of the City of Peace and Justice. You can take the floor, Jan van Zane, Mayor Jan van Zane. Monsieur le Président, Youssouf, Monsieur le Minister Bloch, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, et toutes les personnes qui nous suivent, en ligne. En tant que maire de la Haye, field international de la paix et de la justice et vie des Nations Unies, je suis très honoré de prendre la parole devant vous à l'occasion de l'anniversaire des Nations Unies, célébré ici dans la grande salle de justice de la Cour internationale de justice. Un anniversaire particulier qui intervient en des temps exceptionnels et difficiles. Naturellement, nous avions imaginé des festivités 
bien différentes, mais les circonstances actuelles nous invitent peut-être à prendre davantage conscience des acquis de la période d'après-guerre. Les nations, les nations Unies rêvent de plusieurs générations représentent sans conteste le plus remarquable de ces acquis. Permettez-moi à présent de poursuivre en anglais. When the United Nations was born 75 years ago, large parts of the world lay in ruin. The Hague had also suffered greatly during the Second World War. Many were grieving the loss of loved ones fallen on the front, murdered in concentration camps, or killed in bombing raids. You needed coupons to buy many things and there were still shortages of everything, except for one thing, hope. Hope for a better future, more humane future, to live in peace and freedom. The founding of the United Nations gave that hope wings and renewed courage to people all over the world. Now, 75 years later, We can look back with gratitude on what the United Nations and its affiliated organizations have achieved. 75 years of United Nations and countless stories of people whose lives took a decisive turn because of the UN's involvement. People who learned to read and write, for example, who could develop this themselves and create a new life for themselves after a disaster or war. And now too, the world is filled with hope. Hope that the pandemic, which has gripped us all and taken so many victims, will soon come to an end. As Secretary General Antonio Guterres said earlier this summer, the world's urban regions were the ground zero of the pandemic. On average, 90% of reported cases have been in cities, which is not surprising, given that more than half the world's population lives in cities. In the meantime, the cities still have to keep their public services running. That they have so far succeeded says a lot about the resilience of cities and their inhabitants. But it also means that repairing the damage caused by COVID-19 will have to take place mainly in the urban regions. From well before the pandemic, cities were largely working to meet the sustainable development goals, such as tackling poverty and social inequality, or providing clean drinking water and decent sanitary facilities. The Hague plays a leading role in achieving Goal 16, peace, justice and strong public services, including in finding solutions to international issues such as migration and climate change that are becoming more and more important, as was discussed before. The vast majority of climate measures will have to be implemented locally, in a practical, hands-on way. All in all, quite apart from the coronavirus, local authorities are finding that more and more global issues are landing on their plate. This is also why cities have sought each other out in international alliances, such as the UCLG, the United Cities and Local Governments, and the Global Parliament of mayors, alliances where they can learn from each other and give a clear signal, listen to us, just like to the youth, and re involve us in tackling the challenges facing our world. Cities find the United Nations standing along, alongside them in this, as shown by the calls made, made by the Secretary General 
on the battle against climate change and dealing with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. I believe that these and other matters will only be resolved when cities are more closely involved in determining the course of the United Nations. A course which, more than ever, must be focused on tomorrow and beyond, on the on generations to come. And therefore, it's only logical that there should be an important role for young people during the celebration of this United Nations anniversary. After all, it essentially boils down to the future they want and the, Uni the United Nations they need. The Hague City would be very pleased to offer young people a platform to think about this and how appropriate it was that we just saw the T-shirt and the manifesto and the chair, otherwise, in other words, the presentation of the young one's findings. And I'm very curious to know more. Excellencies, everyone, the 75th anniversary of the United Nations is a call to us all. The call, even now as nationalist sentiments are increasingly heard, is to continue our commitment to international cooperation, peace, justice and security. To be able to live in freedom and security, free from fear. Freedom from fear was one of the four freedoms formulated by US President Roosevelt. And that laid the foundations for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, part of our identity, the identity of our city, of the UN. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wait, wait. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the mayor for those beautiful words. And looking at today, the session that we've been able to have here together, listening to those beautiful words, but especially to all the contributions made by all these young people, which have previously also talked in September with other young people to come to this point and to talk here. I think that it's very important that we have done this today. I think it's very important that we have included young people in this, in this session and that we've had this dialogue. And I hope that this, that this is something that we will continue to do forward, that we will continue with this and that this is the next 75 years for the United Nations. I can't help but wonder, but think back of a quote that I once heard a while ago. And I think it perfectly applies to the situation here with us as young people present. The quote went something like, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, but we borrow her from our children. And if we borrow this earth and this world in which we live from our children, then we do not just have an obligation to offer them a good earth, a sustainable one, a peaceful one, a just one, but we also have an obligation to include them in the process of shaping it. So I'm very grateful for all you young people and everybody here to be here. Thank you to Merit for the Hague Youth Manifesto, to all our speakers, to all the young people, all our viewers at home. I, I love the fact that you ended it with that you're looking forward to tomorrow, uh, <laughs> Mayor Van Sana. I'm also looking forward to hopefully seeing the shirts that were all under your seats on someday. Perhaps a nice picture of you with the, the Hague Youth Manifesto uh, <laughs> t-shirt on. So that would be a lovely thing. Now, as you might know, all over Europe today, buildings will be lit in the blue lights of the United Nations to celebrate the 75 years of the, United, of the United Nations that are still to come. You might have also been wondering why this thing is here and why that big button is here. I know that causes for a lot of curiosity, but we're going to tell you more right now because the Peace Palace where we are present right now, will also be lit blue as a celebration for the next 75 years of the United Nations. The time has come for the world to know that we need a stronger United Nations, a newer United Nations, in which all voices will be equally heard, including those of young people. That is why I would like to invite Minister Block and Judge Yusuf to join us here on the stage, of course, within the right distance of a meter and a half, 
You can wait here and then we'll come up in a second. Because then together with everybody here in the room, everybody watching from home, we are going to lit the Peace Palace in the beautiful blue color of the United Nations. And I'm going to ask you in a second to count down with me so that we can do this together. Yes, you can join us now on the stage. Okay, and then, yes, everybody ready for the big moment? Okay, and then Mayor van Zana, up to you to stand over here and I will count down for you. Three, two, one, go! To the next 75 years of the United Nations, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, President Youssef. Thank you, Minister Block. Thank you, students, and thank you, Merit, and everybody who has watched this live stream with us. I'd like to thank the International Court of Justice for hosting and Hague Project Peace and Justice for organizing this very special edition of UN75. Many thanks to you all, and let's set peace and justice in motion together. Merci, Monsieur le Maire. Merci, le Président Youssef, les ministres Block, les étudiants, et bien sûr, vous les téléspectateurs regardant de chez eux. Je voudrais également remercier le Cour international de justice de nous avoir accueillis ainsi que le projet de la Haye pour la paix et la justice d'avoir organisé cette édition très spéciale de, du 75e anniversaire de l'ONU. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a good night.